Well, REPEC, uh, Research Papers in Economics, is something I've been involved in and Boston College has been involved in for a number of years now. Uh, it's a completely volunteer organization with a zero budget. Uh, sorry to say, because if we, uh, if we had some funding, there's certainly good uses we could put it to. But uh, it is uh, a volu volunteers from across, uh, across the country and around the world. Uh, thankfully, we just uh, one of our leading um, members just moved to the Fed of St. Louis. He was a faculty member at Connecticut, and he moved to the Fed of St. Louis, and who is going to be doing and he's going to be doing a lot of work there. Basically, they're giving him uh, a chance to carry on a lot of the things he's doing for Repic with the so-called Ideas Service, uh, with their sponsorship and, of course, their technical support and uh, staff and everything else, which is excellent. But I think. One of, the, one of the quite interesting things about the program is that we now have, I just updated the stats this morning at the end of the month, uh, we now have over 1,300 archives around the world. Uh, of the nine that were added this last month, which I, which I just sent out an email about, uh, seven of those were from abroad, and some of them from third world countries. And so one of the most important things about this process, I think, is that not only does it make a lot of things accessible to people around the world who might not otherwise have access to it, but it gives them a chance to publicize what they're doing. And that's, I think, a very, a very democratizing sort of thing about the whole open access movement, that anyone can participate, just as anyone can write a blog or something like that or produce a wiki. Anyone can participate in the open access process, and I think that's had a, a very positive impact on research uh, around the world. So we have, uh, we have very detailed statistics. We have a logging site that keeps track of statistics, uh, both, by, uh, both by service and also by individual um, item and uh, by individual, so that anyone who registers for REPEC and claims their publications within it which they have to do themselves. We don't know which John Smith wrote that paper, after all. The, the correct John Smith has to step up. Once they do, they get uh, feedback on just how popular their materials are, how many times people have looked at the abstract, how many people have downloaded the paper. Um, and that, I think, is something that a lot of people are very, uh, very encouraged about. Um, Combining that with the kind of information that's now available in other sites such as Google Scholar, which gives us access to um, how many citations have been uh, made to our work, I think that's incredibly useful. And I think in that latter respect, one of the very positive things is that unlike something like uh, the sort of official citation statistics in something like Social Science Site Index in my field, which only include certain journals um, and do not generally include citations from working papers and preprints. Uh, something like Google Scholar pulls that information together, as does Repex Citation Service, uh, from everywhere where the work has been cited. And, you know, of course it's important to have publications in peer reviewed journals, but uh, one has to recognize that if you're looking for the state of the art in what's being done in a research area, you have to look out there at the working papers because that's where the material is first unveiled. It may take years to get it into a published journal. Um, and so the publication lag, lag there, if a graduate student comes to me, a PhD student, and says, uh, I'm interested in this topic, I say, well, look in REPEC, look in Google Scholar, look for anything about that topic you can find. Don't constrain yourself to looking at what's in the published literature, because that's what was done five years ago. What you want is what was done last year, what was done in response to the financial crisis, what research has been done in that period looking at what's happened in the last couple of years, that's up-to-date material. You'll find it in central bank materials, you'll find it in research institutes um, or in university publications, working papers, but only with some lag will you find that coming out uh, in the published form. So I think it's been very valuable to have these various services such as uh, REPEC and Google Scholar uh, and SSRN that all pull together uh, citations and references to materials that are out there, whether or not they've been officially published, um, and make them available to everyone. 
I think that's I think that is happening. Uh, I I read uh, an academic paper recently that talked about the sort of democratization of co-authorship that's taken place in recent years. That people at top-ranked institutions are now much more likely to work with people at lesser-known institutions or foreign institutions than they were. Um, they, than they were five or ten years ago, and this is in my discipline of economics, but I imagine it's been happening elsewhere just because of the ease of communicating and working with people over the internet using Skype and chat and that sort of thing. Uh, but I think it's certainly the case that the emphasis on peer review or even the whole notion of peer review is changing and is evolving, and I think it really needs to in many ways. Uh, there are some serious problems with the current process. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, is very negative is that many times you'll get reports on a paper which essentially say uh, that the reviewer would like you to write this paper uh, rather than critiquing what you wrote and making, making it acceptable for publication. No, we, we want you to change you know, your, your whole focus of what you're doing here, that if I were going to write this paper, this is what I would write. Well, that really is sort of a perversion of the process, and uh, it, it doesn't work well. There's been some pushback against that. Uh, one journal, at least in our discipline, has uh, come up with a, a, an option to get a thumbs up, thumbs down, rather than the back and forth, back and forth, three or four time process that's going on now. But it is, a very, um, it is a very frustrating process and I think to a large degree the whole notion of, um, of having, uh, putting so much weight on having uh, top ranked peer reviewed publications in promotion and tenure in academics or in recognition in any other field, I think those things are changing to some degree and I think it really they should because certainly Working papers uh, and other non-traditional publications can have a huge impact. Uh, in my field of applied econometrics, for instance, there are at least two cases I can think of where something circulated for many years in working paper form, a new methodology that was used widely in the discipline, published in the finest journals by other people, but the original paper took years to come out. In one case, uh, 11 years as cited on the journal front page between the time submitted and the time of eventually, uh, eventually published. Well, you have to ask whether the authors are going to outlive their publication or not in those cases. So I think that the flaws in that process really suggest that changes are needed. We can't in some sense wait for uh, years of scrutiny for things to come out that may have an important impact on the kinds of research we can do and the kinds of questions we can answer. And I think that's all the more evident uh, in these days with financial crises in, in Europe, in uh, problems in America, with uh, budget issues and so on. We need quick feedback on this, this sort of thing. And in some sense, uh, we should perhaps be relying on the reputation of the author and co-authors um, rather than perhaps uh, what journal did it appear in because that's, uh, I think, becoming a, a somewhat less relevant criterion in many ways. Well, I've heard that argument and you've certainly made it on numerous occasions. Uh, I myself uh, sign the forms and send them in, and I suspect most of my colleagues do so. At the same time, certainly um, a number of my colleagues just sort of ignore the issue and uh, post materials uh, that may indeed be violation of their copyright agreement, and uh, to some degree, you know, the publishers don't necessarily come after you for that. I mean, I don't uh, post the final publisher produced copy of the item anywhere on the web because I know that is not supposed to be done. But I have no problem posting the last revised version that I sent to the publisher and I think uh, you know most publishers these days are, are okay with that. But I think the whole area of journals, particularly commercially produced journals, for-profit journals, are, uh, are a more and more serious problem 
because those who are serving as editors and associate editors for the journals don't receive much for their services in terms of the time they put in and the effort that they put in to do their job. Um, journal publishers charge, uh, as, as you certainly know, outrageous amounts for many of these titles and uh, you know the rents are not going uh, where they should. And I think it's very positive that, for instance, the American Economic Association has now started four new journals, uh, sort of second tier journals, um, that, uh, that are uh, open access and that, uh, that essentially uh, are trying to draw some of the best work away from the for-profit sector. Because I think ultimately we all recognize the, the for-profit journal publishing industry is uh, you know, is, is not a sustainable model um, in economic terms. You know, if healthcare will eat up the entire GDP of the U.S. in 50 years, journal publishers will eat up the entire library budget of everybody in, in the country uh, in shorter time than that. And, uh, you know, that can't happen. Uh, so what's going to happen? Uh, we have to ask that question. And I think uh, some answers have got to be forthcoming because as it stands, uh, you know, the uh, what, uh, what people are paying to have access to those refereed, peer-reviewed journals um, uh, are just uh, outrageous sums. I, th I think that should be taken up by uh, universities um, around the world. I think that that should happen. Um, I think we should follow the lead of Harvard and MIT in this area because I think that would do a lot to um, perhaps deal with some of the financial pressures involved. Um, I think it's really quite uh, unreasonable that, uh, that faculty, in essence, uh, faculty's institutions have to buy back their own work. Uh, this work is work for hire by an employee of the university. The idea that you have to buy it back is, is, is patently ridiculous. But um, without a mandate, it's not going to happen. So I, I would be all in favor of that. I think we should move toward that. I think um, we, I, I would hope that uh, something like the uh, ARL institutions might consider a, um, a policy, um, a, a, a proposed uh, model policy of that sort for all the institutions that, that are research institutions. I think if everyone in that group did it, it would be a lot harder for the publishers to maintain their their stance. Uh, I'm an associate editor of one journal, The Stated Journal, uh, which uh, is a peer-reviewed journal, started about 10 years ago. And from the outset, I argued, as did several of the other AEs, that there should be a moving wall um, produced uh, by the company that would make, uh, make that journal accessible in that, in this case, they chose three years, which is a, a common choice for a moving wall, I think. Um, and I think that's a very positive thing. Uh, I can understand that they, they don't want to make it, uh, you know, they want to have subscriptions to the journal. They want to make th some money from the journal, uh, although it's certainly not um, a money-making operation. But, um, you know, they want revenue. But uh, the idea that they are going to lock up the articles forever is, is something they agreed was quite unreasonable and quite against the whole point of having uh, this material out there. So they, they have maintained um, a moving wall every quarter. One more issue three years back becomes uh, fully accessible and downloadable, and I think that's, uh, that's the way it should be. Uh, I don't really see, I can see the rationale for charging for subscriptions to current journals. Um, it is a very annoying thing that every so often I go and try to get an article from, uh, in my case, I was writing a paper last, last month that was looking at some material that was written in 1960s. And I ran into issues that, oh, well, we don't have access, free access, electronic access, to the files of certain journals, certain prestigious journals going back that far. So it took an additional step. And that's, that's quite unreasonable. That's historical information. Um, and uh, yes, I understand copyright lasts for 70 years and all of that, but I think it's quite unreasonable that it's so difficult to get access to something as a researcher that uh, that is nearly as old as I am.